Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Rohila and today in this class we are going to discuss a famous poem Ode on a Gracian Urn composed by John Keats. The poem is a part of the fourth unit of the syllabus of the paper British Romantic Literature. As we have discussed already in the last class that 1819 was the year when Keats came up with a series of odes. So this ode was also among them. This ode is addressed to a Gratian urn. And what is an urn? So an urn in simple words is a rounded vase with a narrow neck. Here the urn which Keats is referring to is a piece of Gratian art and sculpture. And we know that Keats had an extraordinary interest in Hellenism, that is the study of ancient Greek culture. So we can say that this poem was inspired by the same. Keats was highly influenced by the Greek art and culture. And in 1816, he came up with a sonnet on seeing the Elgin marbles, which are marble sculptures from Greece and Keats was awestruck with them when he saw them during his visit to the British Museum. Similarly, the present poem that is Ode on a Gratian Urn also speaks of a vase made of marble with Greek reliefs on it. It is to be noted here that the critics are not sure if Keats was talking about a particular verse that had all these figures and narratives that he discussed in the poem or he was simply talking about the Gratian urn in general and not a specific uh, piece of art. Keats himself had also traced a picture of an urn which he saw in Henry Moss's book A Collection of Antique Vases, Altars, Petery. This is the image of the same but this does not have any such figures on it. So we can say that this was not the piece of art that Keats was referring to in this poem. The poem was written in 1819 and was first published in 1820 in an art magazine called Annals of Fine Art. The poem was not much appreciated by his contemporaries but later on as the significance of symbolism increased in literary criticism the 20th century critics acknowledged it with much acclaim and thus 
it is now considered among the greatest works of the 19th century in this poem keats uses the symbol of the grecian urn to convey his idea of permanence of beauty in art so the main theme of the poem is that the beauty of art never fades now let us begin with the text of the poem the poem has five ten line stanzas in it and the first stanza begins as thou still unravished bright of quietness thou foster child of silence and slow time silvan historian who can't thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme what leaf fringed legends haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in tempe of the or the dales of arcady what men or gods are these what maiden sloth what mad pursuit what struggle to escape what pipes and timbrels what wild ecstasy in the first line we see that the speaker addresses the urn personifying it and he calls it unravished bride of quietness so unravished here means untarnished and still continuing with its luster and bride of quietness so the urn is like a bride who is married to quietness or in other words it's a companion of quietness however the use of the word still in the first line is a bit ambiguous whether it is used as an adverb or as an adjective which means whether it is signifying its state or its continuity in time if it is calling it motionless unravished bride of quietness or it is calling it a bride which is still unravished or still not worn out but in both the cases the word fits into the context very well in the next line he calls it a foster child of silence and slow time it also could imply that the artist might have worked in silence very slowly to carve this piece of art thus it is a foster child and then in the third line he calls it a silvan historian silver here means rural or rustic who can express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme in the first four lines the poet uses three metaphors for the urn and he calls it a historian who though does not speak but it still can express a tale better than the poets could do since the urn has some sculptural reliefs carved on it that depict certain scenes so he is basically referring to those scenes that relate some narrative to the speaker therefore he calls it a historian in the next line he says what leaf fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in tempe or the dales of arcady so looking at the images carved there he asks with a puzzled mind about the flowery tale which does not give him a very clear picture of who are the people who figure on the vase whether they are the deities or humans or both are there 
so if they are deities are they in tempe so tempe is situated near mount olympus and is the sacred place of apollo who is uh, the god of poetry and music and is the son of zeus or if they are mortals are they in the dales of arcady so arcady is uh, for arcadia which is in greece and the place is known for its rural simplicity and peacefulness so here it suggests that the scenes which are there on the vase depict the bucolic or pastoral atmosphere and the poet does not know which part of greece they are in he further doubts what men or gods are they what maidens loath what mad pursuit what struggle to escape so in these questions it seems that using his imagination the poet completes the scenes here and he wonders who are these men or gods and who are these reluctant women as if the men or gods are pursuing these maidens or chasing them and the maidens are reluctant and are struggling to escape and further he asks what pipes and timbrels what wild ecstasy so although the urn is characterized by quietness and silence and is static but the chase escape struggle and the images of the musical instruments like pipes and timbrels on it make it sound musical and the last question what wild ecstasy that shows the passionate scenes on it thus the first stanza has seven questions which the poet is confused about or we can also say that more than confused he is excited to see all this and this curiosity is out of that excitement the questions begin with the word what and the repetition of the word shows the use of anaphora here personification and metaphors have been used in the stanza very beautifully and another figure of speech used here is assonance that is the repetition of vowel sounds which can be seen in the phrases like bright of quietness and child of silence and slow time here the repetition of i is very frequent now let us move on to the stanza number 2 the second stanza reads as heart melodies are sweet but those unheard are sweeter therefore ye soft pipes play on not to the sensual ear but more endeared pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone fair youth beneath the trees thou canst now leave thy song nor ever can those trees be bare bold lover never never canst thou kiss though winning near the goal yet do not grieve she cannot fade though thou hast not thy bliss for ever will thou love and she be fair so the first line in the second stanza again takes us to the images on the urn that show that there are scenes of musicians playing uh, 
but the music on the urn cannot be heard by anyone so the poet here says that the heard melodies are sweet that is the music that can be heard by ears is sweet but those unheard are sweeter that is the the one that is there on the urn that music he finds sweeter since the unheard has the quality of being abstract and thus it can be heard with spirit only and not by physical ears therefore he urges to the musicians to play it on but not to the physical ear but to the spiritual ear and these songs of no tone through the soft pipes he finds more appealing further looking at the urn the poet finds that art has immortalized everything on the urn they are all imperishable he tells that the fair youth singing beneath the tree will always be there the tree will be evergreen so the musicality of the song that represents art and the leaves of the tree that represent nature are temporal things but here nature and art seem timeless although nature ultimately represents death and regeneration but here on earth things do not die he goes on to say that the bold lover who can never kiss the beloved although he is very near the goal but the poet still asks the lover not to grieve over it since the beloved will always be beautiful her beauty will never fade away and the lover would always love her the same way although the goal is not achieved but still the beauty is there permanently so here after the never ending song that is art and the never fading trees that is nature the poet has uh, here talked about never dying love so in totality life is portrayed on the earth where time may not cause any decay or change in passions and things so the third stanza goes as a happy happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu and happy melodist unwearied forever piping songs forever new more happy love more happy happy love forever warm and still to be enjoyed forever panting and forever young all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed a burning forehead and a parching tongue so continuing the idea of the previous stanza here as well the poet says that the trees which are there on earth always are having happy boughs as they never shed leaves and the spring season never bids farewell to them spring season never says goodbye to them the musician always is happy and untiring and he pipes new songs forever the love which is shown on the urn is also forever happy and forever warm and enjoyable the lovers are forever chasing and panting and are forever young so all the three things that we discussed in the last stanza 
that is nature art and love all are happy here the first couplet talks about the happy nature the second couplet talks about the musician or the artist who is piping and in the next three lines he talks of happy love on one hand the poet tries to emphasize here this idea of happy love and on the other all this he finds difficult to believe and understand it means he is trying hard to understand and identify with their happiness and suddenly he realizes something and in the last three lines he says all breathing human passions far above so till now he was in a different world it was a world of the urn the abstract world where nothing fades nothing dies nothing changes the nature the life human emotions passions nothing but in the real world in the real life where there are breathing passions they change and wane or we can say that the fulfillment of a desire in a life of senses leads to a sorrowful and cloyed state and this gap of these two worlds or this realization or consciousness of this difference to the poet leaves his heart sorrowful and surfeited with sadness the the word cloyed means surfeited with something or to fill something with more than full here it is sadness so his heart is cloyed or full of sadness his physical presence makes him feel his forehead burning and the tongue parching or drying which is enough to make him realize that his presence and existence is not abstract like those figures on the urn but he is in the world in this real world so the poet here conveys the idea that the changeability of life in mortal terms produces effects which are negative whereas the timeless and unchangeable state in the urn is immortal so the urn the, uh, there are no negative effects of transitoriness and thus he leaves us to reflect on life and its significance now moving forward in the next stanza he says who are these coming to the sacrifice to what green altar o mysterious priest leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands stressed what little town by river or sea shore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk this pious morn and little town thy streets for ever more will silent be and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return so here we see the shift in the mood and tone of the thought we are no longer visualizing here the rustic lovers and the trees and other things that were there in the previous stanzas now the poet is looking at some other images on the urn so he sees there some scenes where there is a mysterious priest who is taking a heifer to some green altar 
for sacrifice so a heifer is a young cow and probably there is some procession or gathering shown there that makes the poet question in the first line who are these people or who are these men coming to the sacrifice and then the priest leading the heifer which is decked up with garlands and lowing at the skies the lowing is mooing or the low noise that uh, heifer makes gives the poet the idea of this religious practice in which an animal is sacrificed as an offer to the deity by the whole community so there are some religious undertones in the in the stanza and in these lines and further in the next three lines the speaker imagines the town or the village where they all probably have come from to attend this religious practice or ceremony the small town is not depicted there on the urn but the poet is reflecting upon it and it is his imagination that completes the scene so he wonders if the little town is situated near the seashore or by the river side or mountain and if the town is built with a citadel so a citadel is a castle or fortress which is built to protect towns and for their peaceful living now that all the people have gathered to attend the sacrificial uh, ceremony the poet is wondering about the empty town and he is imagining that in such a pious or auspicious morning all the townsmen are here in the next three lines he addresses the town and says that little town your streets will remain silent forever now and there shall be not a soul to tell where the people are and why you are that is the town is desolate or isolated and if the people will ever return to this place thus the poem now has a melancholic tone and this stanza shows how the art can stir the poet's imagination that he can see what is not shown there now the final stanza of the poem goes as o etic shape fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden wheat thou silent form does tease us out of thought as doth eternity cold pastoral when old age shall this generation waste thou shall remain in midst of other woe than ours a friend to man to whom thou says beauty is truth truth beauty that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know here the poet again addresses to the urn and calls it o attic shape so there was a historical place called attica in greece and the urn has a classic hellenistic sculpture of this place called attica this is why the poet calls it o attic shape now here we see that the poet in the first stanza has called the urn with different metaphors and he has personified it 
uh, in the first stanza, whereas here the urn is more like an artistic object to him. And looking at the graceful presence and appearance of the urn, he further calls it fair attitude. Attic shape and fair attitude are the apostrophes he uses here for the urn. Next he says, with breed of marble, men and maidens overwrought. That means the inanimate object of art, that is the urn, is fully ornate with men and maidens. Braided with marble on it. Breed is braided. And besides them, there are forest branches and bushes also are there. But he further addresses it and describes it as a silent form which reminds us of the first stanza in which the poet calls it the bride of quietness and foster child of silence. So here he again emphasizes on this idea of its silence and says that it does tease us out of thought as does eternity. The phrase here means that the urn is a parallel to eternity and we humans are mortals. We are unable to comprehend the true meaning of eternity. So the thought of eternity perplexes us and so does the existence of the urn since it represents eternity in silent form and thus the, the urn teases the human beings by giving us the thought of eternity and permanence. We have seen in the previous stanzas how the trees are forever green, beloveds are forever young and beautiful, lovers are forever in love and chasing, the music is never fading and the singer is never tiring. So all these uh, present the ideal state of life or we can call it perfection of life. But this idea of permanence or eternity is just teasing us since in real life there is no such thing as eternity and things keep changing. And then for the same reason the poet refers to the urn as cold pastoral. Cold for giving us the false ideas. Co Cold here also stands for the physical feature of coldness of the marble. So the poet here now envisions future of the present generation and tells that when this generation shall grow old, the urn will still remain the same. It won't change. It will still be there. And this is the main difference of the two lives. That is the real one and that is there on the urn, the abstract life. When we grow there, uh, there will be different woes or sorrows than we have now. Nevertheless, the poet is sure that the urn shall ever be a friend to man to whom it would always disseminate the message that beauty is truth and truth is beauty. And that is the only thing one must know to live on the earth. Here, the idea of art being beautiful takes into it the idea of art being truthful also. Beauty devoid of truth cannot be essentially beauty and truth is to be always the ultimate beauty. Moreover, this makes beauty and truth the one and the same thing. 
In other words, it can be said that art is the thing that has both beauty and truth together. So in these five stanzas, through the Gracian urn, Keats reflects upon the beauty of art and as we know that Keats is known for the picturesque quality of his poetry, so here also we could very well visualize the figures wrought on the urn that he described in the poem. The poem is considered to be a masterpiece by Keats for its visual imagery and lyricism. The figures depicted on the urn illustrate some people, events, expressions and passions very well. Apart from them, it also talks about the places and practices of great significance to Greek culture. Thus, Keats' love for Hellenism, that is, his interest in the culture and religion of ancient Greece is quite evident here. For Keats, art is not just a representative of beauty, but it also represents life. Although the life presented in the poem has different characteristics than the real life, but it still makes the reader delve into the idea of existence and the significance of life. Thereafter, the idea that through beauty only, human beings can attain truth and ultimately beauty itself is truth is another theme of the poem. Here in the poem, the Grecian urn becomes a symbol of an abstract life which symbolizes permanence and immortality along with art and beauty. Since it is out of the shackles of time which is responsible for any change. Nothing changes in the abstract life. And this timelessness lends perfection to things as per the real life or the world. The quietness, the stillness or motionlessness, silence and coldness, all the words contribute to the characteristics, this characteristic of the urn that it is unchangeable. The time seems frozen in it, whereas the real life is transient. Everything is temporary here. However, the real world which is full of fleeting passions and desires is mortal and temporary. It is full of woes and death and decay and change and everything that makes it an imperfect place or we can say it is an imperfect life. We can see that Keats was very much engrossed with the idea of life and death. Therefore, the poem focuses much upon the transitoriness of life and eternity of art. After this comes into being the power of art and its beauty that makes the poet and also the reader to participate in it. When the poet personifies the urn and starts imagining the places from where the men and women made on, uh, on the urn must be. So from a mere observer, he becomes uh, a participant. He gets transported into that world for a while and imagines their life. This shows the power of art and beauty. Keats emphasizes upon this in his aphoristic statement that Ern says to the humankind at the end of the poem that beauty is truth and truth beauty. This signifies 
Keats' philosophy of art and life, but at the same time, it seems very complex to understand uh, this quote since he does not elaborate much upon this. Now, let us discuss the structure of the poem. This 50 line ode is an ekphrasis. An ekphrasis is a literary description of a visual art. So, we can call it an ekphrastic poetry. This type of writing was also a Hellenistic invention. And here, the urn is being described by the poet very vividly with all its details. This ode is divided into five stanzas and each stanza has ten lines in it. The ten lines of the stanzas are further divided into a quatrain that rhymes as AB, AB and a sestet, often called a Miltonic sestet. But the rhyme scheme of the sestets in all the five stanzas is different. In the first stanza, the sestet rhymes as CDE, DCE. In second, it is CDE, CED. In the third and the fourth stanzas, it is CDE, CDE. And the last stanza rhymes as the first only. Keats experimented with the classical odes of Pindar and thus the structure of this ode is not same as the Pindaric ode. Odes originated in uh, Greece. So probably this is the reason Keats found this form to be the most appropriate form for this poem. Now let us look at the literary devices. The poem is rich in symbolism. Nature with all its seasons and colors, music with its instruments, silence and love, all these symbols very aptly help in elaborating upon the ideas of mortality and eternity. The poet has also used apostrophe here Throughout the poem, the poet is addressing to the urn with different names. And apart from this, thou, thy, to different subjects also has occurred in it. O etic shape is another address to the urn. Metaphors and personifications are also there. With apostrophe, it's clear that there is someone who is being addressed. But the urn is an inanimate object. So Keats has personified it by calling it a, a, a bride, an unravished bride of quietness. That is the urn is the bride of quietness and they are, they are, they as married couple have lived together. Then in the next line, he refers to the urn as a foster child of silence and slow time. That stands for the fact that urn is the child who has been parented by silence and time. Here, it is noticeable that silence, because the urn doesn't speak anything with its physical uh, characteristics and time which is the greatest change maker and uh, destroyer has rather protected the urn instead of destroying it. The third metaphor in line is Sylvan historian that stands for the historian who tells us the story or the flowery tale of the rustic culture and Greek life. Towards the, uh, towards the end, the urn has been called etic shape, fair attitude and cold pastoral. 
so all these words are different metaphors for the object of art that is earn and towards the end it also has an agency and speaks to the human kind a philosophical statement which personifies it pretty well repetition of the word happy six times in the beginning of the stanza functions as an intensifier and enhances the impact of the word which is the use of anaphora the poem is full of alliterations metaphors assonance and anaphora some of which we have already discussed in the poem so it was all about the poem and now we put an end to it i hope it was easy to understand thank you